This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back. Uh, so first, I want to give a little spiel about the Frederick Trier Fellowship Award. So it was started in 1956 by Frederick Trier, and it's available to plant students and landscape architecture students at Cornell to leave, you know, to study plants, uh, like a horticultural topic of their choosing, outside of the United States and Canada. And so this has been going on for over a half a century. It's funded by an endowment. So it's not just for horticultural students, but it has to follow a horticultural topic. So right now, uh, we have a plant pathology and a plant breeding student that are also away on, like, on Dreer fellowships right now. Uh, Megan Hall is in Tasmania. She uh, works on, like, on grape uh, sour rot uh, with Wayne Wilcox. And James Keach works on impatient breeding. Um, and he's in Thailand right now. And he's working on uh, the propagation of orchids. And so there's a real big, uh, there's a rich history and a plethora of topics that people have studied on this award. And uh, a big part of it is to, you know, I'm thinking as I just like to get an experience, not necessarily to study one thing in particular for the purpose of doing research to produce a product, but to, like, for, like for that recipient to, get to experience how things are done, like how plants are grown in a different part of the world. So like Don mentioned, I had worked in, you know, like in California and in Chile, which are more Mediterranean climates. And then it was a big shock coming to, you know, like to upstate New York to see how things are grown here. And you know, like I've certainly learned, like I learned a ton and like during my masters. And, but I wanted to take a look at Spanish viticultural practices for a number of reasons. Um, and so, like primarily, so it has a long history of, of viticulture. This is you know, like a mosaic in Merida, which is from the Roman era. Like wine been being, has been made in Spain for over 3,000 years. Uh, there are hundreds of varietals native to the area. Um, they have more vineyards, you know, more area planted to vineyard than any other country in the world in Spain. But they rank number fourth in the world in wine grape production largely because it's a really dry area that like they receive uh, little precipitation and they don't have uh, good access to irrigation, you know, like sources to irrigate with. And in fact, until 1996, it was illegal to, uh, to irrigate vineyards in Spain. They have made that legal since, and so that's starting to pick up. But with such a long history of dry farming, it is something that really interested me. Um, you know, to, you know, especially with water becoming you know, like such a hot button issue when it comes to um, viticulture in terms of farming. And like, if you take a look at, at California, we'll see you know, what, you know, how things develop there. I'm also fluent in Spanish, so that would make things easy to, like, for me to get around. So uh, fortunately, I was able to, um, like to start to head, out, you know, like to head over in August. I left to go to Spain. So um, as you can see, Spain has these really tall mountains going right, up, right across the top of it. So they have the Pyrenees right here, and then you have the Cantabrian Mountains, the Picos de, de Europa, that really like, sever off the rest of the Iberian Peninsula from, like, from northern Europe. And this makes, you know, like, a, like, casts a rain shadow across the entire area. You also have, like, so this is like a map that shows altitude. Uh, not dryness. So you can see that they have this large central plateau, the Meseta Central. And so you have like, this area that's relatively dry and relatively high in altitude. Uh, here is a map that shows you um, pre like precipitation throughout the country. So you can see that the majority of the country receives somewhere between 300 to seven, 800 milliliters of, like, of water a, a year. And you can see that along the top you have this big band formed by the mountains, and here's Galicia, what's known, like in Asturias, known as Green Spain. Um, I, I'll talk more about that area, but you can see where the vast majority of, you know, like of Spain is like, um, like this, it sits in this rain shadow. So the first place I went, to go, I went to go visit when I went there was to visit my friend Ignacio. Uh, I met Ignacio about five years ago when I was living in Peru. I was his English teacher. Uh, admittedly, I wasn't a great English teacher. I like to think about better horticulturist than I am a Spanish teacher, <laughs> uh, English teacher, sorry. But uh, he since received a job promotion and now lives in Madrid. And so it was, I have to say, like, um, it was wonderful having him and his family there. If I ever wanted a home-cooked meal and I was in town, 
was always there. I could leave you know, extra extra things there. Uh, and, but the first uh, the first place we went was up to Sain de Gallego in the Pyrenees Mountains. Here we are, and so it just shows you this giant. You know, like that's what like severs the rest of Spain from France. Um, like that's France, you know, like right here along like the border goes right along the tops of those mountains. Um, and so that's what really divides you know, uh, Spain from the, from the rest of Europe. Um, I also went up there to go uh, to the Pyrenees where there are no vineyards right off the bat because in August, Spain really goes on vacation. I thought that it was just a, you know, like a term, like people say, like lots of Europeans go on vacation in August, but really the country shuts down. Um, you know, so, like, uh, there are lots of city centers that are just really empty and vacant then. Uh, but afterward, like, so I decided to go see a couple of places that I really wanted to see, and then I could focus on being able to visit a lot more professionals later. Um, and so my first trip uh, to study you know, grapes went down into Uronda, which is in Andalusia in southern Spain, because they were starting to harvest in August, so they couldn't go on vacation. And so Uronda is most famous for its bridges. Uh, this was built in the 18th century. Uh, they have several of them that span these giant gorges uh, up on this major um, uh, plateau where Ronda sits. But it is, like it used to be in the Roman era, a major production of grapevines. After phylloxera hit, they really pared down. Uh, but now you can see, so these are olive groves right here, vineyards, and all of this is wheat production primarily. Uh, but during the summer, like they'll harvest in the uh, late spring, early summer. And like, so you'll have a lot of barren ground from there. So it's um, really sort of, like really shocking to see like, like this like vibrant, lush uh, grape canopy is coming out of this area that's otherwise so brown. Um, and so I went to Descalzos Viejo. It's a winery in a 16th century monastery, and they found these paintings behind layers of plaster and paint. Uh, it's uh, and they just like decided to re to restore them. But it's a beautiful, beautiful place. But I went like I hung out with their analogists. Vicente and showed me around their like, their vineyards. Um, and so like, they do a lot of really interesting things as you know, like in comparison to other areas that I'm used to. Uh, they like they try and crop heavier and not leaf pull like you would think in many areas uh, because they like to have uh, more protection for the grapes to to shade them. You can see that this is what the canopies look like. So they have that really cuts down on their labor costs where they don't like where they have to do uh, very little. They don't really have to do much in terms of hedging, et cetera, because the vines just can't grow that much. Uh, as far as other interesting practices, they'll plant vines and um, they'll, after the first growing season, they'll cut them down to just two buds on the scion, just so they can promote all of that, like, like, more resources towards root growth in those first years. And um, yeah, some like, really, really tasty wines. But this is a growing region. It hasn't been, uh, like it's starting to have a, a renaissance of growing grapes. Uh, after it got shut down for a while. Another area that I visited, uh, which is a, a little bit further to the east is, uh, by the town of Nerja, is like, are these vineyards, which are, um, so I'm at about a thousand meters here. And you can see the ocean, actually. This is the Mediterranean down here, but it's up these windy roads that are, um, you know, so as the crow flies, you're only a couple of kilometers away from the ocean, but you're up really high. And these are Moscato de Alhandria. Um, grapes and so the, like this has a really interesting uh, history because they were originally uh, used to, to make wine um, historically by the, like by the by the Romans. It's a muscat, like a white muscat grape, but they were kept in the region by the Moors when they came by because they make great raisins. But now there's a move to take these already existing vineyards and shift them from raisin production towards wine production, and they make a really lovely white wine. It's a dry, it's a dry muscat wine, so it has those like, terpene um, like type, type notes, those overripe honey like type flavors, but it's a dry wine. It's, it's really nice um, if, you can, if you can find a bottle. But after that, I went to Jerez, which is by the city of, of Cadiz, which is here, and it's where sherry is produced. And this is like, one of my favorite places that I got to visit in Spain. I didn't really think that I, I didn't know that much about sherry. Um, it's, it has this reputation of maybe like a, a pa like past generations really like to drink sherry as an, as an after, like after dinner drink. And a big reason why it's as, like as big as it is is that it sits right by the port city of, of Cadiz. Cadiz is the oldest city in Western Europe. Uh, the Phoenicians founded it about 3,000 years ago. People have been making wine there for 
three millennia. And uh, sherry is made in three cities, so Jerez, Santa Marta, and San Lucar. And between this triangle is where all of the grapes are grown, uh, primarily Palomino is the name of the grape, um, and then aged in wineries in these three cities. And so this is what the area looks like. It's these rolling hills close to the ocean with these really you know, calcareous uh, soils. Anything that is green here is grapevines. Um, and they crop extraordinarily heavy. Uh, it reminded me of Concord production uh, around western New York, where you have these extremely high yields. You can get up to 20-some you know, tons per hectare. Uh, the grapes have really little acid. They, have, they don't have that much sugar. You can only ferment them up to maybe 10, 11 percent alcohol. Um, and yeah, they're, like, they're not, they don't really have any flavor. They're kind of just a body to then do aging with. Um, and so then you have all of these sherry houses where they have a system where like, in order to maintain uniformity of the product of sherry, they'll have them aging in these, like where they decant maybe 10% down from the top. This will be the, like, the youngest wine. They'll, like, twice a year, they'll put 10% down into here, which goes down into there. And then like, on the, f like the stuff on the floor is the oldest, and that will head off to market then. And so there's some wine in here that's probably close to 100 years old, and it's been diluted down all that time, but in order to, to maintain a consistent product, because this has traditionally been, uh, sherry has been something that is shipped. Uh, it's 80% of the market goes outside of Spain still. Um, you know, it gets really remarkable in that standpoint. And also because the grapes have so little character, the, like the terroir and like the difference uh, that you get between different areas really comes more from what city, you know, what the climate is like in the city where these things are aged for 25 years or so before, you know, before they're released, which is really fascinating. Um, there's, you know, part of it is they have headspace in the barrels where it's about 15% alcohol in here, and then a yeast layer grows on the top layer, and some on the bottom as well, but the yeast produces kind of like a waxy film that helps like, separate the, you know, protect, it, like, protect the wine from oxidation and you know, it gives it these yeasty flavors. So that's what a fino sherry is. The um, more nutty sherries, those have higher alcohol and those are stored without this biological layer here. Um, you know, can, so that's just straight up oxidized wine, essentially, that's been fortified. Uh, and if that's the, the, what the flavor you're going for, it makes a great wine to ship all over the world because like, you can't really get any worse. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, like, so it already has, like, it's already oxidized, it has high alcohol content. So as far as something that you can like, put in a barrel and send out all over the world, it's a pretty resilient, you know, like, pr like pretty resilient thing to ship. Um, so, like, so, you know, like, so that's been a lot, it was really interesting to, to learn about. There are a number of different things that you can do. It. Like I mentioned, so there's the biological aging, there are there's something in between called an amontillado, which is just fun to say. Um, you know, like, and then there are like your you know, like dry sherry, sweet sherries, where you add you know, like, um, like sweet wine from uh, like Pedro Jimenez grapes. And, like, there's too much to get into and just, you know, like, I have like 45 minutes to go through everything. Um, they have these traditional er zones called uh, tamancos, which are like traditional areas where you go to drink sherry. This is Pepe. Uh, and he has, his family's been running this tabanco for about a hundred years. Um, and he you know, like, tried to show me how uh, the palo cortado is, is made, like on the, on the bar counter. Um, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. But he also, uh, he also showed me how, um, like told me about a research station, a germplasm collection close by that I was able to go visit, uh, which was really fascinating. So I met with Dr. Miguel Benitez, and he is like the head of the germplasm collection. It's one of the two chief germplasm collections in Spain. And so it was a lot of fun to see a lot of the different varieties that they have there. Um, the clonal selection, like the oldest like, uh, clonal selection in Spain was done in Jerez. Jerez was one of the first cities in the world to have electricity. Uh, like wine really pushed this, like pushed the city. It was like a like really wealthy the city of splendor, like back in the day, and a lot of it was tied to grapes. And so they have a long history of like of research going on in this area. So I was able to learn a lot from him, running like walking around their research station. This is Mi this is Melonera, which is one grape that they're trying to bring back that's re uh, native to the area. Really big berries, as you can see. 
Uh, and they have these lines along them. They're um, like, really fascinating. Uh, you can see, like, there I am in their, um, you know, like in their research station, you know, like their, like their different fermentation trials. Uh, now, that, was, that was a lot of fun. But then after that, I shot clear across Spain and up to Bordeaux, because why not? Um, no, like, there are, like, I have two, like, uh, like, I don't know if any of you know Maya Dallavalle. Uh, she was a master's student in food science working in, in enology. Her family owns the Della Valle uh, winery in, in Napa, and she is currently a student at the University of Bordeaux. And so when I knew that she was there, she invited me to crash on her couch. So um, I couldn't refuse that invitation. Also, uh, many of you probably know Miss Amanda Sims, uh, a former student of Alan Laxo. She came over to, like, like, so we overlapped and could go visit Bordeaux together, which was a lot of fun to have a travel companion that spoke a smattering of French. Um, I don't speak any French. It's uh, just none. Um, but here's a general map of, you know, of Bordeaux. It's the largest appellation in France. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, the diversity there is really amazing. Uh, so this is, like, you have the Madoc around here, which is more flat and gravelly. You have Sauternes. Uh, being made around, around Graves, uh, then you have the whole Saint, Saint Emilion area. I don't want to get into too much detail on this, but it was really amazing to see places that produce $5 bottles of wine versus 500 euro bottles of wine, which was something else. You can also see that they have really, really tight spacing. Um, you know, and so this plays out with how they spray. Like So here are their sprayers, really, really narrow. They can spray four rows at one time. Uh, and even though they have like, such tight planting, maybe a meter, a meter and a half between rows, and maybe a meter between plants, um, they're able to have a really high density of canopy in this, you know, like in this system, which works out really well. Um, it also makes the vines compete with one another because they're in a more wet climate. So that works out to their, you know, to their favor. Um, you can see you know, like how these things look like when they snake through, through these vineyards. A lot of them have these spider-looking tractors that go over the rows, which is pretty cool to see. Um, I also got to visit Cheval Blanc, uh, Klaus van Leeuwen, who came last year, uh, who is a professor at the University of Bordeaux, also does some consulting work with, um, like with Cheval Blanc, which is one of like, the highest-end Bordeaux in the world, which is a lot of fun to see how they do, do this. These are their um, concrete tanks. Um, they, they look funny, um, again, funky. There's no um, practical reason for that, just because they look pretty, uh, I asked. Uh, there's, yeah, yeah, they look cool, but uh, that's, that's the only reason. Um, I also was able to see some really cool ground cover management practices. Um, so this is a semillon block uh, in, like, in a Sauterne vineyard. The older vines, because uh, the production is lower, they'll leave no ground cover, uh, whereas in in newer vines, they will leave ground cover to try and equilibrate the you know, the two blocks. Uh, at Cheval Blanc, they'll like they'll have cultivation practices where they try and move the top 10, 10 centimeters of ground, where they push it under the vines and then bring it back down to try and keep roots from growing in that top layer, uh, which prevent them from absorbing water during summer rains, which could uh, help promote berry splitting or the dilution of flavors. So it was fun to pick up. Uh, like a little bit of know-how of what they do around there. But then after Bordeaux, I went to Pais Basco around here and to Galicia. This is green Spain. So this is where a lot of white wine is, you know, is made in, in the country. So here are a bunch of, like a, a winemaker, I forget her name. Um, I, uh, Iñaki, I think it is. Like, they're, like the, the Ushkarai names are, like the, like the Basque names are really difficult to pronounce for me. But she, like she, we had a great conversation telling me about how she manages her, her vineyards in this area to make Chacolí, which is a really high acid wine um, that's grown in, in Pais Basco. It's really, really interesting area. It's really similar to the Finger Lake. She reminds me a lot of the Finger Lake, except for like the palm trees around there. But um, like, that's just like, the only reason like, is that they, they can survive the winters. It, it doesn't get that cold during the winters, but um, they have really similar problems with downy mildew and you know, things of that, of, of that manner. Here you have normal VSP trellises, but most of the area, they have pergola trellises where you have these posts and then a bunch of wires on top where it creates essentially a roof over the vineyard. Uh, it allows them to achieve much higher yields, but it also makes mechanization nearly impossible. They also have these really cool tractors, um, where you have, like, because they're so low, you can't enclose it. So you have to have these really low tractors uh, to be able to get underneath there. And then 
these guys wear these spacesuits hooked up to respirators in order to get through there. Um, yeah, so again, it's just like funny to see like how creative people get to deal with these different situations. Uh, here's Barbara. Uh, she, like this is in an Albarino vineyard in Rias Baixas. You can see, er, like there's a lot of granite everywhere in this area as well. You can see uh, the pergola system here is supported by uh, granite posts. Uh, everything is made out of stone there, even <laughs> even, <laughs> even vineyard posts. Um, it was also really interesting to see the different pace of how people work here. Like I was saying, this has to be done, all, like most of the work here has to be done by hand. Um, and this is a picking crew. They're paid by hour, not by weight, like they are in the United States. And um, yeah, people are just kind of like taking their, like they're kind of taking their time just, just going through. There's a different pace to how everything is done. Um, but wages are still relatively low. Uh, and so, I, as you can see, with the price points of wines around, you know, you know, in the liquor store, that Spain is really competitive, for, especially for the quality of what they produce. Um, there's also a lot of people that do their, their own farming, like on a small level. So you can see, like, you'll see just like a couple of um, you know, like, like older women driving around. Uh, these are probably, I think these are Labrusca um, grapes right here. Like they're harvesting, harvesting to make wine on, on their own. There's still a lot of people that make their own wine, uh, make their own cider, uh, things like that, and have their own small plots. Um, it's like a big part of the culture to have like your own garden, have your own small vineyard. There are a lot of people that have like fairly size, like, like fairly large tracts of land that they take care of. Um, and so after Galicia, um, I went on to Toro and then to Ribera de Duero, which are some of the more famous areas. So if I couldn't think of anything more unlike Galicia when I got to Toro, which is just this dry, sun-baked, barren place with really sandy soils. Um, these vines, they're spaced three meters apart. Like so, three meters by three meters, and you know, there's really there's very little work that people have to do. You have to cultivate once a year in the spring because after that nothing can like, can reestablish roots. Uh, it's like it's so dry. These vines are not grafted. There's no phylloxera in this area. Phylloxera can't you know, can't grow in vines that are that are this sandy. Um, and they produce like a variety called Tinta de Toro, which is really really dark and, like, and rich. It's it's um, Really interesting, uh, but again, like most of the costs or everything is hand. It has to be hand done here. You have to hand thin. You have to hand prune. You have to hand pick. You can't, you can't mechanize any of this. And so, as as things change, we'll see what the difference is. I mean, like a lot of the differences that I saw between like, newer vineyards and older vineyards is trying to bring in the capability to mechanize. You know, is the big thing. So putting things on a trellis for no other reason, just to be able to harvest it mechanically. Um, but it's really difficult to do that when you need to maintain spacing this, this wide apart. And, like, there are no, like, there, like, there's nowhere to find water to irrigate here, even if you wanted to. Uh, so that kind of dictates how, you know, you know, like how, like how are you able to grow in, in these areas. Um, you can also see here, so this is the difference in, like, so carbonic, carbonically macerated grapes uh, um, like to make wine are really common here. You can see the difference in color that this makes as opposed to a traditional wine. Um, and so it like, adds a lot of variety and fruitiness there. Um, you know, if you ever see that anything is carbonically macerated, um, it means that the initial fermentation was done in an absence of oxygen with whole berries that fermented a little bit inside of themselves that produced these really distinct flavors. You should try it if you haven't. And then after that, I went to Ribera de Duero. Um, I really think that, you know, so this is like a newer area. You can see they have really wide spacing there. And it's right by the Rio Duero. So a lot of these areas have irrigation, um, really more of a security system than anything else. But because it's a really flat valley, they're able to, like, to get away with this, uh, have big spacing, big vines. Um, a lot of the areas are, you can see that everything is just on a really large scale here. A lot of this is because it wasn't a, like a big traditional wine producing area. Um, and here's a view from on top of a castle. Oftentimes they would have the best views of, of the landscape. Um, and a lot of this used to be sunflower and wheat. And it was only recently turned over in the 1980s they started to do this. And so I think that uh, actually a lot of the better budget wines coming out of Spain are coming from Ribera de Duero. Uh, Rioja is maybe the more famous area. But I'm a big, big proponent and fan of things coming out of Ribera de Duero, especially for like your more 
economic ones. Um, yeah, again, so you have a lot of like large, like large volume production facilities. Most of what they grow around there is Tempranillo, but I tried maybe the best Syrah of my life when I was there. Uh, this is a winery um, called, called Bodegas Visar. Um, I was able to meet up with the owner, Felipe. He actually, and then he invited me to a bullfight ac afterwards, which was a lot of fun. I, I still don't know how I feel about that. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's, I, I mean, like, I think it's something that I'm, I'm glad I did. I don't know if I'd want to go to more bullfights, but it's, uh, it's a really beautiful spectacle, uh, but pretty gruesome at the same time. Um, but yeah, so, so Ribera de Duero was, like, so is maybe by volume, you know, like the second most important wine producing area. The most important one is Rioja, like, or the most famous one is Rioja, which is situated in this little valley here. So you have just a stunning looking valley. This is what it looks like there. I mean, like there's nothing better than just getting a rental car and cruising around these small little towns uh, dotted with these medieval walled towns. Mm. It's stunning. It's my favorite place in Spain. Um, the food is fantastic as well. And Logroño is a city of, like the capital has about 150,000 people in it. It's mm. a must see. Uh, but you can see that you have this small patchwork of, you know, like of, vineyards here. I mean, they've been producing wines here for a very long time. A lot of the parcels, most of them are under a hectare in size. And like I met some families, they've been, like, they've had like titles to these blocks since the 1400s. Um, you know, so it's a really interesting area in terms of how people are able to work this, with this patchwork and this history. Um, a big reason why it became such a big famous wine producing area is because when Phylloxera was ravaging France, a lot of French winemakers came to Rioja. They had good connection with rail lines going back up to France. And like, it's, a, uh, it's like an excellent wine grape producing region. And they brought a lot of French technology, of winemaking technology, down to, you know, like down to Spain in terms of aging in oak barrels, uh, different treatments you know, like to, you know, um, like to that really boost the quality of the wine. So, like, so like, the potential from the grapes were always there. Uh, but the, like uh, some French influence really helped uh, advance the the quality of their wines there, and so it has a, a, a much longer story. Is that lethal? Le um, on like the virus on the I think it is. Yeah, uh, these are well, these are also Tempranillos, and like this is later in the season, closer to harvest, and Tempranillo is you know, like you think of it as you know, the Spanish grape that is able to survive you know, like in what you think as this hot Mediterranean climate. It's a lot more finicky than than I thought it was. So this is relatively a relatively cool climate in comparison to a lot of other areas in Spain, um, and so it really gets zapped when you have it in you know, like in higher heat areas. Also, wind can really easily damage its shoots, and so um, when that happens then they'll send out a secondary shoot and then that'll have fruit that comes out you know, like off of a, a secondary which blooms later which means that it it's delayed in ripeness like behind the, the primary crop which can uh, cause big problems when you're trying to harvest that block because then you'll have a bunch of unripe fruit that's mixed in uh, which which isn't good so you want to have it in the in the right conditions to grow that, I think that's why you don't really see it outside of Spain that much it it does really well under these specific conditions, but it hasn't really adapted well, hasn't really been exported that well to other areas because I think that there are a number of factors that it really needs to, uh, like to produce good wine. Um, but you can see um, up here, so they have the, um, you know, like the Cantabrian Mountains right up, like right against the north. You can see that it really stops a lot of bad weather from coming in here. If you like, if you just cross over that mountain range, you're in, you know, you're in Asturias, you're in the like in the Cantabrian area around País Basco, right up there, uh, which is a really really green zone. Like from where I was showing you those photos earlier, um, and so yeah, it gets like this really stunning landscape. Um, what was on the end of the road? Oh, rose bushes. Rose. Um, yeah, people say that uh, that's to, you know, I guess, like a canary in the coal mine for different diseases attacking them. I don't buy that. I think it's really more of traditionally, uh, you know, like the story you do buy is putting them there so that horses traditionally wouldn't scratch the end posts and dislodge them because they're covered in thorns. Like that's the one I think is more feasible. Um, but you can just see that it's this really beautiful area, uh, like with this with a small patchwork of you know of vines everywhere. Which is, I think, would be a nightmare to um, to try and control. But it also, 
you go up the sides of these hills, and so it makes it really difficult to irrigate in this area as well. So you don't see much irrigation. Also, because so many of these vines are so old, it'd just be really difficult to install a system that would work. Um, but you also have a lot of your older, pre like premier wines being produced there. This is you know, like from a wine like Sierra Cantabria. They have this big labyrinth of you know, like of caves underneath their facility, which is really something to, to behold. And uh, like, uh, like some exquisite wines, like fantastic. But uh, things that are normally out of my price range. Um, <laughs> like, uh, and so, yeah, so I think that Rioja makes great, excellent wine. But uh, like as far as their base level, uh, like there are other regions in Spain that I think have a lot more potential than Rioja does. Um, you know, kind of like your fine, nuanced wines, they're really good at. I don't think they're as good as you know, like your, you know, like your baseline, make them, you know, you know, like make your grad students happy type wine. <laughs> Um, also, in the town of Briones, if you're ever in, in Rioja, this is the best wine magazine, I, I mean, like wine um, museum that I've ever been to. It kind of reminds me of the Corning Museum of Glass, where, like, have you all been to the Corning Museum of Glass? Yeah, where they have a great science section and then they have a great art section, and it really ties the two together. Um, and that's something that always kind of interested me in viticulture and enology as well. Here's a collection of all of their, uh, of a bunch of different corkscrews. They probably like they have tens of thousands of corkscrews all lined up, and you know, according to their different styles. Um, but they also have like there's a wonderful section on how to grow grapes, how to make corks, how to make barrels, how to make uh, bottles, like how to make glass bottles. Because you know, they have this great um, technology mm. area, and then they have a beautiful, beautiful art museum, all like, that is dedicated to wine. Like so, they have like old old biblical scenes, like that that feature wine or um, cups that are 10,000 years old that were used to serve wine from, from Persia, or um, like Picasso's that feature a bottle of wine. It's really something else. And plus, it's in Briones, which is this beautiful old medieval town. Um, I really can't say enough about Rioja. It's really something else. But after Rioja, I started an internship in the town of Borja, which is in Aragon. Uh, the capital is, is, is Aragosa. Borja is a town of about 5,000 people. There isn't a whole lot going on there. Um, it's a really agricultural town. Uh, it was a lot of fun to, to live there, just to get that you know, like authentic, off the beaten path um, experience. Although uh, Borja recently became famous because it is the home of. Wait, like, so here is like the owner. Uh, no, the uh, head of viticulture for Bodegas Borsal, uh, who I was working for. Um, we literally got to go around to hundreds and hundreds of these small vineyards. Up in these, you know, like, these, like high, high areas, the vast majority is is Garnacha. Uh, it's also spread in with a lot of almond orchards. Almonds are going bananas up there uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because because of the drought in, in in California, it's really boosted the price of almonds on the market, and so there's a big move towards almond production in in this area. Like they're doing really well with that, um, but you also have you know, all of these small, small plots of, of grapes in this area as well. Um, and like, so Borsau is part of a collective. There are maybe 600 different farmers. Some of them are, are professional farmers full time. Like they'll, they'll produce olives or you know, um, you know, like almonds or, like, or grapes. And the collective has to buy all of the grapes there. So there's a big diversity in, like, in what gets produced. You have wine that's made into like five liter jugs that are, sell for five euros, or there are like, you know, like Garnachas that win 100 points from Robert Parker and cost, you know, close to $100 a bottle. So there's a really big diversity, which is so much fun to see such a diversity in vineyards when I was out there. It was, you know, I mean, like it was like so much fun, especially to work with um, Alberto the entire time. The guy just, like he's been working, he's from the area, he's been working there for 20 years for this company. Um, I still don't know how he knew where all the different vineyards were. I'm telling you, everything was just this maze of dirt roads, and somehow he would know like, how to get to all these different little under one hectare sized plots all the time. Um, a part of it that was really interesting is that we did really very little chemical analysis of grapes to figure out when we would harvest and what kind of wine to make. We would do everything by taste. You know, uh, so we would just go around and eat grapes all day. Um, which is actually really bad because these are really, really 
tannic and and sugary grapes. Um, and I was thinking about it too much, like chewing on chewing on things too long, and I destroyed my mouth within a couple of days. I had like all like, chapped lips and like sores on my tongue. It was really bad. Um, fortunately, but I was able to like to get faster with you know with how I would do uh, like, on, like all the tasting. But being able to do that and taste from so many different vineyards and talk to someone who's an expert was maybe uh, the most important um, thing that I took away from you know, from working there. Uh, it's a skill that you re like. It's, it's a really unique opportunity, to especially be able to like to taste from hundreds of, of vineyards uh, to make all these comparisons, which was a lot of fun. Uh, Borja is famous. Um, like recently, was the news it became famous because it's the home of the Eche Omo de Borja, which is a tiny. Uh, oh wait, sorry. Like so. Yeah, I, I, I have so many slides I get mixed up in what's coming next. But yeah, so this is a very large winery. Um, like, so this is like you have like machine harvested grapes being dropped off to a subterranean crusher that then push things to the large tanks. Um, yeah, cause like a really like large facility. It would go through you know, like thousands and thousands of tons of grapes. Um, really impressive. But it also do small lot fermentations as well. A big, big range. Um, but it's home of the Eche Omo de Borja. I don't know if you've seen any of this. Uh, uh, in, in these, so that's what Borja is most famous for, is this funky painting that this woman was going to restore and did a horrible job on. Um, and, but now it's more famous than ever. Uh, it's bringing in tourists from all over the world to take a look at this, you know, at this painting. Uh, like, so that's what it looked like before. That's what it looks like now. <laughs> like that, that's the restoration job. But I would argue that it is not the weirdest or creepiest painting in Borja. Uh, there is a, this, this great cafeteria uh, that I became, I became friends with the owner. I'd eat there, I'd have like, my lunch and dinner there every day. And this is hanging up in, in, in his restaurant. So this is a painting, it, it's an original from the 80s. Um, and that is the former king of, you know, like of Spain, Carlos. Uh, so this is like a like Spain here being upheld by a bunch of hands, and then you have like a rather svelte, uh, bare-chested King Charles wearing a gold necklace with his arms crossed, uh, growing out of the land, uh, as, as long like as well as like a, a naked pair like uh, with a pregnant woman. Um, yeah, so I, I, I look at that every day, like for, for 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 five weeks for lunch and dinner, I'd see that every day, just looking at it. Um, uh, yeah, what a yeah. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> um, that I'll never forget that. <laughs> um, but this is what they like. What I think the area should be more famous for is just these old vine, uh, like these old old Grenache vines. A lot of them are um, 60 years plus, and you know, just like these gnarly old looking vines. Um, like, but they produce some of the most exquisite tasting wine that I've ever tried. Um, it's really something else. Uh, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, you also have these fiery red soils, and like there's a, like just a big diversity in like in what you find out there. And it's a beautiful area as well, as you can see. Just, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a bad place to hang out for like, for a while. Uh, I guess we learned a lot there. Um, and here's something to show you. Like so, so Garnacha, it's the most planted red variety in like like red grape variety like for for wine in the world. And so here's Tempranillo on either side. And this is Garnacha. You can just see that it is resilient. It can take a beating. It crops heavy, um, but it really like it. You know, like, so this is late, late in the season. It's always the last thing to come in, uh, just because it, you know, it can really hang on there. Like, in, like under these uh, under these conditions, you can see that the Tempranillo is starting to fall apart. Like that, like I could identify what variety of vineyard was from hundreds of meters away. Uh, just because uh, you can see like the the condition that the canopy is in, so so Garnacha is really pretty beastly, heavy duty grape that can handle a lot a lot of different conditions. But I think it really needs these to produce high high quality fruit. I think that a lot of people plant it in other areas just because it can handle ad ad adversity. But a lot of times they crop it really really heavy. It doesn't really work out that well. Um, yeah, so like that was, like, that was a lot of fun to learn about Garnacha. Um, but after that, uh, like the harvest was over. There wasn't really too much more to do, but um, apples were still in season. Uh, so I went up to Asturias to learn about cider production. And as, as, as many of you know, I'm really interested in apples and cider. Um, and so Asturias is a really, really beautiful area. So it's, uh, it's wedged between the Picos de Europa. Uh, so, the, like, so this is what the mountains look like in, in the area. Um, 
It's really weird though. You'll see like herds of goat and sheep, like goats and sheep, walking through there with shepherds. They make a lot of cheese up there, um, and bordered by the sea as well. It's just like a really, really stunning area. But they have a strong tradition of making cider, just because grapes don't really grow well in that area. Um, so it's really different than other varieties of cider that you may be aware of because it is more acidic. It has to go through malolactic fermentation. Uh, it's, like the, it's so acidic and it's not carbonated. But to aerate it, they pour it from a, like from a, like a tall height. So this isn't in a cidreria, in a uh, like where they pour it from, you know, like the waiters hold it above their head and they have these little splash guards because otherwise you'd make a mess everywhere. There are some places that have drains in the floor where they just hose the place down every night. Um, the traditional way to do it is out of a tank. Um, and again, so this is Cesar. He was really, really nice showing me around the whole area. And you can see that traditionally they were served out of, out of tanks. And you can see like, all the mess that he's making there um, with the like, splashing around. Um, like, so like, I don't think that Spanish cider traditionally can be expanded. Uh, just because it's 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 its own thing, you know, like, and you're supposed to just pour a little bit and then down it in you know, like in a few gulps when it's still cloudy with all of the um, gas and carbonation from it. Um, but you know, it was a lot of fun to learn about their their production practices. I met with a couple of professors that study this. Uh, most of the you know, most of the orchards are really small in size because you have such diversity in in topography in the area. And you'll have a lot of people that just manage these as a, as a side business. Uh, it's not their full-time job. Um, and, so, and because of that, they don't, they don't fruit thin, they don't spray anything, they just grow apples, harvest them, and turn them into cider. Um, so it was really interesting to see I, I, different strategies for growing these, like, in these minimal investment orchards in this area. Uh, and you can just see, and then they just drop them off. You'll have all these different varieties mixed together. They don't really make blends. They just make cider with what shows up at, at the door. I was really surprised to see just uh, like them all thro thrown together like that. Um, yeah, I can see, yeah, um, they're not the prettiest apples, but they make great, great, great tasting cider. Um, traditionally, they were made in these giant oak vats. This is Roberto, like the owner of a large cidery. Um, yeah, I can, so like that's what they're traditionally made, at, made in. Uh, nowadays, they're, it's more like white wine production. Like, a lot of the facilities look similar to a lot of wineries I've been to. Um, yeah, I guess got to help empty out a press and some smaller, like in some, you know, this is like, um, you know, kind of smaller cider I was able to like, to check out. Um, that was a lot of fun. And so they really diversify. They're trying to like export uh, and grow and grow the market. So they're trying to to diversify what they're producing. So this is your traditional Asturian cider. Um, they're also trying to make bottle conditioned, um, like fermented ciders that are similar to a to a champagne. Uh, selling apple cider vinegar, or this is a still cider, which is like you know, with some juice added back to make it a little bit sweeter. Uh, so they're trying to like, like to export more and, and diversify what they're doing. Um, so it's interesting to see like how they're trying to like, to move to move things there. Uh, but I also did a couple of other fun things. I went to Porto for a weekend with with Ignacio. That was a lot of fun. Uh, there I am at a porthouse with with Malay, his wife. Um, I hiked uh, 100 kilometers along the Camino de Santiago. It's an old pilgrim, an old pilgrim route. I got a Compostela from the Catholic Church. It's like a get into heaven free card. Uh, so, so I got that going for me. <laughs> uh, my, my parents came by. Uh, I, I got to show them around. Just went to like to play tour guide. There we are in in Sevilla. So um, that was a lot of fun. And then I went away. Oh, and I probably ate about my my own body weight in Hamon. It is. It's its own thing. It, yeah, you gotta. Yeah, yeah, you gotta try it. Um, it's its own food group. Um, it's fantastic. But then, uh, in the final weeks of my Jira, I went down to Peru rapidly. As many of you know, I lived there for a while. I went there for the wedding of my two good friends, Nelly and Killian, uh, which was a lot of fun. I got to read at their wedding, uh, which is like I was a little nervous reading in Spanish in front of a couple hundred people, but it worked out fine. It was a lot of fun. But I also was able to check out grape production when I was down there, um, which is really different than other areas. You can just see how barren all this is. Um, and so they produce a lot of different varieties up here. Uh, this is Octavio. He runs like a, a Pisco production area. Pisco, it's, a, it's like a grappa or an ouzo. It's a distilled grape liquor. Um, and so he was growing grapes out here that were in bloom. And he had Labrosca vines on the other side that were already in Veraison. Basically, they control where the because it is in this like tro semi-tropical environment where they control everything with irrigation and pruning. 
Uh, they can get three harvests in two years off of their labruscas, but they try and just do one a year for their like, for their proniferas uh, like to make you know, uh, you know, like to make pisco out of. So it's really bizarre to see what like how they how they do this. The area produces a lot of cochineum, which are the little scale insects that the dye industry uses to make red dye. Uh, and so you know, this is the same area where they grow cactus. They even have to irrigate cactus here. Like, like you can't, yeah, like there's no water. <laughs> it is dry. Um, yeah, like, and then so yeah, as you can see like the, with the, still, like the arambic stills that they use to make pisco are. Um, and they also, you know, I can, so I'm like two feet taller than everyone there. Um, yeah, like, and I, I was, yeah, like I was also like a bit of like an oddity. There weren't too many gringos making it that far out into this area around Arequipa. Uh, to take a look at pisco production, um, I was able to see like these are the old um, uh, fermenting vats that they use. Some of these date back to the 1700s. Uh, most of them were from like the early to mid 1800s in here. But like these are just what like, like the old old technology that's still in use in these areas to like to ferment like, to ferment in. Um, and then these piscos, this is like um, this. That's what like an old press looks like. Um, and then this is like these are what like the clay vessels. Um, you know, called piscos that were originally used to tra like ferment and then transport uh, pisco in. And this is in Ica, which is the primary grape producing region in Peru, um, which is, you know, it's again, like a, a desert. That's, you know, like, that's right outside of Ica. I mean, it has some of the tallest sand dunes in the world. Like, it's barren, doesn't even start to describe it. Um, and then you just have like this slice of green that, that goes through there where they irrigate everything. Some of the oldest um, agriculture in the Americas comes from coastal Peru in this area where they were irrigating. Uh, surprisingly, uh, they were irrigating cotton and not a food crop. They were irrigating cotton to make uh, textiles and nets to go fish on, like, on the coast with. Um, but yeah, so like really, really old history of irrigation and agriculture in this area where uh, also the oldest vineyards in South America are in this area as well. Uh, but that's where I finished up my travels uh, from, from my journey and I was able to come home right before Christmas. So uh, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the Dreer Committee for letting me have this amazing um, experience. It, uh, being away also gave me a lot of time to reflect and figure out what it is I want to do. And I think that I wouldn't have wound up back here uh, to work on my PhD if it weren't for that. And I'm really excited about what's coming down the road. Uh, so, so thank you for that uh, opportunity. I learned so much in addition to that as well. Um, and, like, this is just a, the tip of the iceberg trying to give you like, the, the highlights of, you know, like, of what happened when I was away. But uh, if you have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to, you know, to answer them for you. <laughs> Justine? They do. No, no, no. They space them. Like they just give them a lot more space between trees. And like, and, and, like, and this, it's a dry area, but it's not as dry as other parts. I mean, like, so in in Aragon, there's there's enough water around. It's it's still pretty scrubby, but they have oak forest in the area. Um, it's not like Toro that I showed you with a three meter by three meter spacing. Uh, it's not as barren as that. So there is some moisture there. Um, and they just like uh, just like with grapevines, where they space them out, they have lower yields per per area. Yeah, they were. Yeah, because the ratio is like eleven gallons for one pound of almonds. Yeah, what well, they're California productivity. Yeah. Well, at the at the price point of almonds right now, they're making money off of it. Okay. You know, they're, they're putting more in. You know, like we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, again, whether like these trees will be in production down the road. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's working for them now. Anyone else? Um, does, the, does the Spanish government regulate production like the French government does in terms of their grapes, in terms of uh, yield per hectare? Um, it depends on the denomination of origin, but yes, uh, I know that in, you know, like, like in certain areas they do uh, in in Jerez with the with the, like the sherry production and in Palomino grapes, they really try and limit that just because there's a tendency to try and crop so heavy heavy there, and so um, they have one of the oldest denomination, like they have the oldest denomination of origin in Spain is from Jerez, um, and they try and control it there. 
Um, uh, yeah, so th uh, there is some control in other areas. Um, you're not supposed to produce um, hybrid vines uh, or babruscas in many areas. I found a couple going around. I think those might have been for personal consumption. Um, yeah, so there is some, there's some control, but it's not as regulated as France. It was the other big impression that I got. Some, some of these areas, uh, the temperatures may reach 40, 45 yeah. degrees centigrade. Yeah. Uh, can you still make uh, wine, good wine out of those grapes? Yeah, well, a lot of it comes down to cultivar selection. A lot of these are Spanish grapes that they use that, have, like, that were developed in these areas that get extraordinarily hot. Uh, they also try and, and leave more vegetation around the fruit zone. Because it's so dry, they don't have to worry about uh, you know, the disease pressure that you have to worry about in, in other areas by having less airflow or less light penetration uh, on, on the berries, so by shading them more with leaves, you protect them more. Uh, yeah, and you don't have to worry as much about, like, about disease pressure, so you can still get away with it. Um, and it gets up to 40, 45 degrees, but um, that's not the whole, that's not the entire season. Like that'll happen in July and in August. You'll get these big and hot temperatures. But in other times of the year, it'll be quite cool. You also have these big diurnal swings in temperature because you have like you're uh, in such a dry climate as well. So like it may only reach that hot for a couple of hours. Any final questions? Yeah. 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 If not, thanks so much, Adam. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.